then at the same time, I was working as a dominatrix part time, which is well documented. <laughs> um, my first book was about that uh, because I didn't have the money to pay for my internships. And it just kind of, all these things kind of synthesized and I became really interested in kind of, yeah, this combination of stuff. Did, did you used to get really weird repressed, repressed <laughs> from people and all that kind of thing? Well, it depends what you mean by weird. I mean, yeah. I'm not the best person to ask anymore because I think my scale of what's strange just kind of gone off yeah. the scale for want yeah, of a yeah. better way of putting it but lots of people were just really interested in very low level BDSM activities they wanted a bit of spanking or they yeah. wanted to be restrained in some way or they wanted to be spanked yeah to me all those things are quite innocent mm -hmm. but it was amazing how many people had deep deep shame about them right and I think what was the most fascinating thing about doing that work was just how much it taught me about how restricted we still are as a society Victorians had loads of um, premarital sex. Did they? Yes, yeah, so at the end of the 19th century, I think a third of all the brides going up the altar were already pregnant on their wedding day. Oh my word, yeah. really? It's a really crazy statistic. Jeez. Yeah, working class women, not so much middle class, but yeah. still like, the majority of the population, like not the majority, so a third of the population yeah. was already pregnant. Yeah. So um, yeah, that to me was, that, that was a bit crazy to me. Like, because yeah. we have this, there's been this misperception for sort of generations about how prudish the Victorians were, and they might have been on a level, but the fact that they were always talking about how not to have sex, of course, meant they were therefore always talking about how to have sex, yeah. if that makes sense. <laughs> it was a bit of like hiding in plain sight kind of thing. <laughs> the chivalry changes every generation, our mm -hmm. definition of it. So, I mean, the original definition is basically about preserving your lady's honour, which is really about making sure she doesn't have sex with anybody before right. marriage. Right. So that's not necessarily somebody will, something we want to bring forward to today. But the idea, and th there's an element of putting someone on a pedestal, well, that really comes from the medieval period, this idea. There's this German word called Frauendienst, which means literally worship of goddesses, like worship of women. Right, okay. So that's where all that stuff originates. And there's also something else really fascinating, which is Petrarch, who created the sonnet, he was writing through the play. So the, this idea that he's put women on a pedestal through his poetry might be related to the fact he couldn't get up and close to them because yeah. of the plague. So I only just found that out recently, which I thought with coronavirus is kind of an interesting parallel. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but, but then, you know, kind of gets the Victorian era and things. Um, there was a huge code around how you uh, gave somebody a, a name card, how you called at their house, whether you were able to lend them an umbrella, you were not meant to lend women umbrellas because really? it was bad. It was it was seen as kind of un, unfeminine to accept an umbrella from somebody. What? And if you if you didn't get your umbrella back, then you were really in trouble, basically. Jeez. So there were there was there, there were things that we would just think are ridiculous, but they put so much emphasis on doing right. Yeah. They also had something called breach of promise, which meant that yeah. um, you could sue uh, you could sue somebody if they broke broke off an engagement if you were a woman. So mm -hmm. if your male partner left you, you could sue him. Right. And this was obviously to protect dowry and to protect, you know, your kind of future if you put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, with someone. Yeah. But, th but while the concept seems chivalrous, what actually would happen is that to um, to kind of get this money, you'd have to go up on the standing court, mm -hmm. and you'd have to uh, basically talk about your sexual history, and then people would kind of like you know lay you open and attack you, and then often you wouldn't get the money anyway, and then really? you have your reputation ruined as well. But I think. You know, kind of taking all those things into account, looking at chivalry today, yeah. for me, chivalry just means good manners. Mm -hmm. It's really about respect. And it's amazing how many men um, really would protest that they respect women, but do some really basic things wrong mm -hmm. in terms of listening to women, yeah. um, really caring about their, not just their feelings, but their intellectual thoughts, their, mm -hmm. in, their inner lives thinking about what would pleasure them in the bedroom as opposed to just like what they can get out of them sexually. Mm -hmm. just, and thinking about like how they make a life with them, who, who has to give up work if they have a kid, how do they split housework. Like they, these are all things that people are still grappling with. And for me, they're part of chivalry because yeah. somebody who's chivalrous wants you to kind of have your, you know, someone wants you to kind of live your best life. And that often means sharing the power and it means sharing the burden of labor. And they're still things that we're negotiating. I've got to say that I think our generation of men in their 40s and 50s now are probably the best generation we've ever had in okay. terms of chivalry. Like, yeah. I really believe that. Yeah. Because when you kind of, you know, 
the reason I say that is, and lots of women will probably say the same thing, yeah. is because they just missed the porn generations. They were right. kind of brought up on like <laughs> yeah. dial up or um, really kind of like, you know, like Basic Instinct or something like that, you know, yeah. like a sexy film that was that's that's right. kind of vaguely pornographic, but that's kind of <laughs> as far as you'd get with it. <laughs> yeah. So they've had to do a lot more work in, time, in terms of reaching out to women, but they've been brought up in a socially liberal society where you're allowed to have sex before marriage. Yeah. And, you know, so that combination, I think, works well. My partner is of that generation, yeah. so I, obviously I think he's very nice. Um, but I think... I think younger generations of men that have been kind of brought up on porn, and I there's plenty of porn that's brilliant and the porn has its place. Like I've been a big, big advocate of porn as a safeguard for monogamy. Because mm. I really do believe if people get to uh, explore their desires through porn, they often won't cheat.